counts, what is it, three felony counts, you know, 25 years of jail, and $750,000 of fine, you know, I, I, I just think that's a bit much. Do you, do you see a link between that and the NDAA, the indefinite detention clause the, the, in Hedges v. Obama? Or I, was, was I haven't read Hedges v. Obama yet, so oh, I can't, cool. I'm not okay. going to opine on that. Good morning, uh, Christian! <laughs> Weave is yelling at his FBI agents, agents someone just said. The one I just went to that's turned so behind is Chris He's He wrote my nice. like, criminal complaint. Oh. <laughs> He's a Navy man. Oh, he's a Navy. He's great, American, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Nothing like killing brown people to show our patriotism, right? Exactly. No, no, he's a Navy man. One of the best hackers I know. Like who has been around DEF CON. I'm not disputing that there are great hackers naval, that come out of the fucking... Naval captain. Uh, Tom Ryan the armed forces. Was in the Marines. However, yep. Thomas Ryan. they're still Tom Ryan. scum of the earth. Yeah. You know, to go and help kill people in foreign countries so that we can have oil <laughs> makes you less than human. It just does. Like, that's just sort of a fact. It's that, it's that they're make, murderous thugs. Make sure you told, tell everyone you've walked here. Yeah. <laughs> we all walked here, I guess. I took a car, but I was driving with the camera. Uh, However, the sentiment was shared. <laughs> It's 9.28 a.m. for those just tuning in. The press conference before Weave's prison sentence is handed out will begin shortly. I stand outside this courthouse today, and I, I feel like America is in a cultural decline. That I look around the kind of pace and the kind of people that we've had in the past 50 years, and it doesn't match the 50 years previous. I feel like, I feel like <laughs> there's something wrong. And, and, in my country, there's a problem, and that problem is the feds. They take everybody's freedom, and they never give it back. And if, if you go, if you go to Georgia, and you have a staph infection, they can, they can have a bacteriophage that they genetically engineer eat your staph. Like, no joke. Whereas here, they're like, we're gonna cut your arm off, we're gonna flood you with antibiotics until you die. Like there, they can have a treatment that's known to be the best of the world because their FDA doesn't define each individual bacteriophage as a new treatment that has to go through clinical trials. If you want to put a drone in the air, like how many commercial applications of drones are there? There's a shit ton. If you want to put a drone in the air and have it speak TCAS, the Traffic Collision Avoidance System, you just can't do that. There's no licensing path for the FDA to, for the FAA to do this. You, you're, you're not allowed to innovate. Stop thinking outside the box, Western man. I feel, I feel like, you know, we could have laptop batteries that last a hundred fucking years. Like, fucking, uh, with, with, with beta voltaics. And, and we can't have this because the NRC says no. 
There are so many engineers working tirelessly in this country to find the best damn solutions to a given problem, and then they find out that it's against the U.S. code. And that's before fucking things like patents, where where attorneys in their in their subhumanity gleefully lord over people that, that are trying to contribute something useful to humanity. And, and I look at all this, and, and I'm saying, I'm going to prison for arithmetic. I added one to a fucking number on a public web server, and I aggregated this data, and I gave it to a fucking journalist at that man's publication. <laughs> and this is why I am going to prison, is arithmetic. Fuck this country. Like, this country, we, ha we are gone. The innovative spirit that our forefathers had, the, the rights that we had in this fucking place are being fucking ruined by wicked tyrants, seditious thugs, and if they have any soul, any soul in their whole body, and they understood what they were doing to the rule of law, to, to the fucking Bill of Rights and to the free and open internet, they, they would die in their own goddamn shame. Either they're, they're malicious, malicious, wicked people <laughs> that want to destroy Western civilization, or they're goddamn fucking morons. <laughs> that it's one or the other, I don't know which it is, but they're evil, either evil or fucking retarded. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I, I, uh, I, I feel like, uh, I feel like Mineta weeping at, 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 her, at her father's feet. And uh, I, I, I hope that the innovation has a, a, a wakeful return as fast as possible. Because there, there isn't much time left to fix this place. I think that I think we have a very short window before the currency collapses and before this place becomes just a, a some third world country. And, and there's there's new Detroits and, and Birmingham's and, and St. Louis's every year. And, and we have we have very little time to manufacture things again and, and bring our country back to the greatness that it was. And uh, I, I hope that you're all on my cell block, all the, all the engineers out there. <laughs> and I'll, I'll see you all in federal prison. <laughs> So it's now 9.34 a.m. We've just given a statement. Very soon we're going to be going into the courtroom. The sentencing is at 10.30. And I'm not going to be able to stay alive at that point. Let's read some Keats before we go in. Yeah. Yeah, why not? Read the basket letters. No, no, no. We're going to read some Keats. Keats. I, I want to read one thing before I go to prison. <laughs> it's, it's the fall of Hyperion. Fall of Hyperion. Uh, left side. His left. Yeah, you know, no, no. You were. You had. A... Fanatics have their dreams wherewith they weave a paradise for a sect. 
The savage, too, from forth the loftiest fashion of his sleep guesses at heaven. Pity these have not tracked upon vellum or wild Indian leaf the shadows of melodious utterance. But bare of laurel they live, dream, and die. For poesy alone can tell her dreams. With the fine spell of words alone can save imagination from the sable charm and dumb enchantment. Who alive can say thou art no poet, mayst not tell thy dreams. Since every man whose soul is not a clod hath visions and would speak if he had loved and been well nurtured in his mother tongue. Whether the dream now purpose to rehearse be poets or fanatics will be known when this warm scribe my hand is in the grave. Methought I stood where trees of every clime, palm, myrtle, oak, and sycamore, and beech, with plantain and spice blossoms formed a screen. In neighborhood of fountains, by the noise soft showering in my ears, and by the touch of scent, not far from roses. Turning round, I saw an arbor with a drooping roof of trellis vines, and bells, and larger blooms like floral censers swinging light in air. Before its wreathed doorway, on a mound of moss, was a spread of feast of summer fruits which nearer seen seemed refuse of a meal by angel tasted, or our mother Eve. For empty shells were scattered on the grass, and grape stalks but half bare, and remnants more sweet smelling, whose pure kinds I could not know. Still was more plenty than the fable horn, thrice emptied, could pour forth, at banqueting, for prospering, returned to her own fields where the white heifers low and appetite, more yearning than I ever felt on earth, I ate deliciously. And after not long, thirsted, for thereby stood a cool vessel of transparent juice, sipped by the wandered bee, the which I took, and pledging all the mortals of this world, and all the dead whose names are on our lips, drank. That full draught is parent of my theme. No Asian poppy, nor elixir fine of the soon fading jealous caliphate, no poison gendered in close monkish cell to thin the scarlet conclave of old men could so have wrapped unwilling life away. Among the fragrant husks and berries crushed, upon the grass I struggled hard against the domineering potion, but in vain. The cloudy swoon came on, and down I sunk like a selenius on an antique vase. How long I slumbered, tis a chance to guess, but sense of life returned, I started up as if with wings. But the fair trees were gone. The mossy mound and arbor were no more. I looked around upon the carved sides of an old sanctuary with roof August, builded so high, it seemed that film clouds might spread beneath, as over the stars of heaven. So old the place was, I remembered none, the like upon the earth. What I had seen of gray cathedrals, buttressed walls, rent towers, the superannuations of sunk realms, where nature's rocks toiled hard, and waves and winds. Seen but the falter of decrepit things to that eternal, domed monument. Upon the marble at my feet there lay store of strange vessels and large draperies which needs had been dyed at bestus wove. Or in that place the moth could not corrupt so white the linen, so in some distinct ran imageries from a somber loom. All in a mingled heap confused there lay robes, golden tongs, censer and chafing dish, girdles and chains and holy jewelries. Turning from these with awe, once more I raised my eyes to fathom the space every way, the embossed roof, the silent, massy range of columns north and south, and in and mist of nothing. Then to eastward, where black gates were shut against the sunrise evermore, then to the west I looked, and saw, far off an image, huge of feature as a cloud at level of whose feet an altar slept, to be approached on either side by steps and marble balustrade and travail to count with toil the innumerable degrees. Towards the altar sober paced I went repressing haste as to unholy there, and coming nearer 
saw beside the shrine one ministering, and there arose a flame. When in mid-May, the sickening east wind shifts sudden to the south, the small, warm rain melts out the frozen incense from all the flowers, and fills the air with so much pleasant health that even the dying man forgets his shroud. Even so, that lofty sacrificial fire, sending forth Mayan incense, spread around forgetfulness of everything but bliss, and clouded all the altar with soft smoke. From which fragrant white curtains thus I heard language pronounced. If thou canst not ascend these steps, die on that marble where thou art. Thy flesh, near cousin to the common dust, will parch for lack of nutriment. Thy bones will wither in a few years and vanish so that not the quickest eye could find a grain of what thou now art on that pavement cold. The sands of thy short life are spent this hour. And no hand in the universe can turn thy hourglass if these gummed leaves be burnt ere thou canst mount up these immortal steps. I heard, I looked, two senses both at once so fine, so subtle felt the tyranny of that fierce threat and the hard task proposed. Prodigious seemed the toil, the leaves were yet burning, when suddenly a palsy chill struck from the paved level up my limbs, and was ascending quick to put cold grasp upon the streams that pulsed beside the throat. I shrieked, and the sharp anguish of thy shriek stung my own ears. I strove hard to escape the numbness, strove to gain the lowest step. Slow, heavy, deadly was my pace. The cold grew stifling, suffocating at the heart. And when I clasped my hands, I felt them not. One minute before death, my ice foot touched the lowest stair. And as it touched, life seemed to pour in at the toes. I mounted up as fair angels on a ladder flew from the green turf to heaven. Holy power, cried I, approaching near the horn shrine. What am I that so should be saved from death? What am I that another death come not to choke my utterance sacrilegious here? All right, let's head in the fucking courthouse. Wait, am I your lawyer? Go fuck it. 9.43 a.m. We have just finished reading some Keats, and we're about to prepare to go in the courtroom. We's lawyer, Tor, Tor Ackland, is currently giving a few uh, interviews. <laughs> so thanks for tuning in. I will have updates uh, on what happens to Weave at a sentencing hearing, so stay tuned.